Hello everybody and welcome back to the Galactic Armory. Today we're going to be talking helmets of our ODST builds. Today we're going to be talking about, Jamie, yours in particular. You're going to take us through the entire build process from the raw cast that we got from Sean Bradley all the way to the finished helmet you see before you now. Isn't that right? Yeah, that's right. This was an incredible project to work on. These helmet casts were top of the line, really clearly designed in a very traditional method with its asymmetries and, you know, really cool details. So we're going to be using a lot of the same techniques that we use here at Galactic Armory on our own helmet casts. And so this tutorial should help you both learn some things working with your own ODST helmets, but also any of the other casts that we have available at GalacticArmory.net. That's absolutely right. Working with casts, it has some advantages advantages and some disadvantages compared to 3D printed helmets. A big advantage being that it's already pre-smoothed and just about ready for painting. We have a few things that we want to do before that though, starting with what? Well, that'll be starting with taking this very large visor out. We want to make sure that we get this right the first time because it is hard to clean up once you've messed up. So take your time with it and gradually cut this thing out. Now, our method for cutting it out is applying a few drill holes along the outline of the cut zone. Right, you just kind of want to perforate the entire visor. Yeah, and it also helps as a guide. Once you've drilled around the entire visor, use a Dremel cutting disc. Whilst a cutting disc on a Dremel would probably be the best tool, there are other methods. Some people I know use coping saws, just that fine saw blade can get through a lot of that right there. And you basically just go dot to dot along the drill points. Right, I know adding those drill points definitely helps with the Dremel cutting disc because if you tilt the cutting disc a little bit in one direction or the other, it will try and run. And I've had it sometimes where the disc will catch and try and run up and away and into the helmet itself, cutting away you know, what we don't want to damage at all. So putting those holes in first definitely helps you connect those dots a lot easier. Yeah, that's right. And once you've done that, you also want to make sure you do a similar job around the neck seal just to open it up. Uh, just to get some of that flashing away. And once that's done, it's time for cleanup. You'll be left with quite a bumpy, lumpy mess. Mm -hmm. But using some standard file tools, it should be a quick job to clean it up. We like to use a sanding drum to just clean up the outside and also shape the visor to be uniform the whole way around because the method of casting often leaves some irregularities on the inside. It'll have some thicker areas, thinner areas, just lumps and bumps and just sign that this was a liquid at one point. Now, all those places that we sanded away are still, you know, pretty rough from the power tools. We're going to do a little bit of cleanup with some Bondo glazing and spot putty. We use that on all our 3D printed helmets all the time, and it works great for casted helmets as well. There's also a little bit of flashing around the seam line of the mold when these helmets were made that just goes kind of over the midsection of the helmet. We just want to sand that down a little bit, put Bondo all around it so that we can even it out so that that line is next to invisible. And to help that along, you can see that I'm using a sanding sponge. Now, the sanding sponge is really good for these sort of surfaces because you're trying to get along a curve rather than a flat surface. And this sanding sponge, as it's named, is a sponge core, so it will actually shape around the helmet's curve and will make sure that you're not getting flat surfaces or disrupting the natural curve of the helmet itself. If you're doing it by hand, you can definitely press too hard with your fingers in one area. The sponge definitely helps dissipates that pressure and spread it out evenly, especially over a curve. And once we're done with that, um, we're happy enough that this surface is uniform. We just want to give one last pass just to make sure that there's no errant gaps or small sections left over from the sanding process. So we're just going to hit it with some standard Rust-Oleum 2-in-1 filler primer. Right. This is just basically a thick spray paint that's going to fill in any last remaining scratches or little pin marks from all of the sanding that you've done. With that dried, we're just about ready to start painting. There is one thing we want to do before we start laying down any colors, though, and that's apply a silver base. Jamie, what is that silver base going to be used for? So this Rust-Oleum aluminum paint will just allow us to create a metallic base that we will try to shine through our later colors. The method of doing this is by using a liquid latex. Now, this liquid latex will just act as a mask. It will create a barrier between the metallic paint and the paint layers that you'll place on later. So once the paint dries, this liquid latex will be really easily scratched off, revealing the metallics below. Right, it's kind of preserving that silver paint that we just laid down, and we can lay other paints on top of this liquid latex just fine. And this creates a really good physical barrier that actually creates a nice natural step in the paint, as though it was naturally scratched off. 
Absolutely. These are both our original concepts. So we had no real references to go off of for our color scheme. And we prototyped it in a few different ways. With the help of uh, GC Concept Art, good friend of the channel, he gave us some stencils that we could use for our full ODST kits. We just brought it into paint, really, and uh, <laughs> dipped and drag and dropped paint and saw what worked and what didn't and uh, tried to figure out different parts of the helmet that we wanted painted and what we didn't want. It was actually quite fun to, uh, you know, draw your own ODST. A sea trooper. Yeah, it was uh, really exciting to actually picture it to begin with because it allows you to sort of pre-plan ahead and picture everything and allow you to sort of see the journey that you have ahead of you. Absolutely. And uh, for the helmet, I did something in Paint 3D. I had a Halo Infinite ODST helmet, which is a bit different from the casts that we have that we're working with, but it had a lot of the same features. And so I brought it into this program that allows you to just basically paint right on an STL file. So I played around with it. You can use the uh, the bucket tool to just kind of color entire sections at once. So you could really try out all different color combinations and placements very easily. I use this tool for just about every original concept on a piece now. If I can't find a 3D file for it, I find something similar for it, like in this case. And it just gives you a good indication of color, spacing, and generally a good feel for it before you actually lay paint down. Yeah, it's a fantastic tool and it really helps you see how colors will work together or potentially not work together. Now with the concepts all finished, we could start laying down some paint. Now the first color we had decided on was a Montana Gold Basalt. This is kind of the color we agreed as the base for our helmets, for the armor, for everything. For this misfit crew, this is the color that we're starting with. And this color really works as a nice gray, but it with military tones of almost off green in it. We think it's a good base that a lot of other colors can work with, as well as the softs underneath. Mm -hmm. And we'll get to it later, but it also takes an oil wash and a weathering very well. So for my design, I was really inspired by the rookie, mm -hmm. which is ironic for a character called Major. Right. <laughs> but when I think ODST, I think of that middle stripe down the center of the helmet. And for my color scheme, I also wanted to add a sort of neutral, again, military aesthetic green to the whole thing. So I use Montana Gold NATO for my armor accent. Now that's kind of your secondary color, right? Yeah, and between the green, the basalt, and then a another tertiary sort of color scheme, which would be Montana Gold Marble, that's my chosen aesthetic that will go across my entire armor. And when you're starting this helmet, it really allows you to see how well these color schemes work together because it's a quick project that you can put out and finish and you'll see how all of these color schemes work together. And when we both finished ours, we were so pleased with how everything came out. Right. I did want to say and mention that throughout the whole painting process of mine, I was kind of unsure about how well the colors were working together. You know, we, we painted it all out. We taped it all out. It was all fresh sitting there with the latex peeled off. And I wasn't sure if I liked it or not. But once we get to this next weathering step, I think it really tied it all in together very well. So when finishing off all of the accents, which is basically blocking out all of the main colors, in this case, finishing off with some Montana Gold Shock Black, we were ready to go for the probably most important part for a military aesthetic armor piece, which is the weathering. Mm -hmm. Making it look actually as if it's seen battle. Now, the method we've chosen for this is going to be an oil wash, mixing some oil paints with a little bit of mineral spirits applying it over the helmet and then wiping off a majority of it, but that will leave behind a good surface finish of, you know, a good black that looks like years of accumulated grime and dirt. Yeah, and this oil paint method is perfect with these Montana Gold paints because these Montana Golds are an acrylic base, which these mineral spirits will not react to. So it will basically just create some surface variation, some changes in tone. It will seep into those recesses, which are numerous across this helmet, and it will make everything look grimy and really battle-worn. And the fantastic benefit of using oil paint is if you don't like it, you can just get some mineral spirit and wipe it away. Yeah, absolutely. It just takes a little bit more, soak it into a paper towel or something and uh, start over. One of my favorite aspects of the oil wash is that it just kind of binds everything together. It coats all of the paints in a very similar finish, in addition to making it all look battle-worn and damaged. I feel like it really unifies everything, pulls it all together. It basically makes all of those surface colors really uniform. 
it draws it all together mm. and with that surface being naturally one color it looks designed to be one uniform piece you can definitely like use other colors of oil paints if you want to go for a different aesthetic say maybe you wanted to be in a desert aesthetic you might use something a little bit uh, lighter like a uh, dustier you can pick like a red if you want it to be on like Mars or some some planet like that. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of play you can uh, you can use in this step. We just like black. I feel like it gives it a good kind of just generic weathered helmet. And you're right, it definitely does seep into all those recessed lines of the helmet very well. I know I went through and touched it up a little bit with just a stippling using the brush, a little bit of dry brushing into the, any of those spots. But after the oil wash, the paint job is basically complete. We have one very big hole we still have to fill in the visor though. And with the Sean Bradley kits, there's a bit of a technique to doing it. Did you want to talk us through how that worked? I know it took some experimenting on your on your side, but uh eventually got it. Yeah, and every helmet will likely have a little different experience with it. Given that these helmets are rotocast, they're often going to have various different surface thicknesses, especially on the inside. So you might have to really take your time to attempt to get this to fit properly. Now, don't worry if it's not fitting well and that, that there's potentially some gaps because we're going to show you a method that can really elevate this helmet and fill in those gaps at the same time. Now, the Sean Bradley kit uses a very large and very three-dimensional visor. It is, it's meant to actually stick outwards from the helmet, which has a few challenges. Now, Sean Bradley recommends that, that we actually drill in some holes into the helmet and then through into the visor using some screws to just pull everything together with a little nut on the inside. It is such a big visor and you're right, it does protrude out and can make sizing it a little bit challenging. So marking those holes and drilling them and then anchoring them in with uh, screws will definitely help you out. And every helmet will be a little bit different in their experience. Aaron's was really easy to put in just because of how the internal surface was made. And there was very few variants there. So when we actually added in the visor, it was pretty easy just to put straight in and anchor it in place. My helmet came out a little bit different and I noticed that there was a significant gap at the top and at the bottom, just with how the visor ended up being anchored. But this was not much of an issue. We just simply used some EVA foam, which is pretty standard in a lot of crafts. Yes, basically just craft foam. Which we then heated up using a heat gun to form a glossy surface. And we just added it along the visor surface, just where it needed it. This ended up being a rather aesthetic choice and created a almost secondary layer to the armor of the helmet. Yeah, I really like it. It acts as both a gap filler and just another detail ridge, something that makes your helmet unique from all the others. Yeah, I really liked how it turned out. It ended up being a, a big eureka moment. And I was quite worried about putting this visor in. It was quite a challenge. But once these aesthetic EVA foam pieces were put in, the visor just fits so snug, so perfect. And I really liked how this extra layer created another chance to add more weathering, more depth, more three dimensions to this overall project. Now that we had the visor inserted, our helmet painted, we got a little bit creative. We have a Silhouette Cameo 4 on hand, and so we decided to cut out some different uh, stencils and uh, different stickers to put on our helmets. I think we both agreed to put our names on our call signs on the back side of our helmets. And this little machine uh, did it quite well. It's it's really fun and we are definitely using it to great use across the entire armor set, especially the weapons as well. I think you're having fun with it, right? Oh yeah, I am using this thing every day. There's always opportunities to add just some practical little details that very few people will notice, but it really draws the armor, the helmet, the weapons to make it slightly more real world lived in military and also personalized mm -hmm. in its aesthetic. This is your chance to be creative with your suit of armor. So I say go all out, add whatever you want to, and whatever makes sense to you. Well, everybody, that is how Jamie made his helmet for his ODST armor kit that were taken to Dragon Con. You can see how I made my helmet. We use pretty much the same techniques throughout the whole thing. I just filmed mine vertical, so it'll be in shorts and all that. I hope you enjoyed watching the video. I know we only have really a month left before Dragon Con, so we're coming down to the wire. We're gonna try and get as many tutorials out before we actually go for you guys. Again, I thank you for watching, and I hope to see you again in the next one real soon.